So good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I welcome you all to the last lecture of our Science Series 2 lecture series, which has been organized by RCB to commemorate India's 75 years of independence. Our speaker for today is Professor Rajendra P. Roy, who is Dean RCB, and it's my pleasure to introduce him um, today. Uh, Professor Roy completed his PhD in biochemistry from the Indian Institute of Science in Bangalore and then did his postdoctoral research at the Albert Einstein College of Medicine in New York. He then returned to India and joined the National Institute of Immunology in New Delhi as a staff scientist. And his research program focuses on developing chemical biology tools for protein semi-synthesis, labeling, and bioconjugation. So his work has been published in several journals of international repute, including the Journal of the American Chemical Society, Protein Science, Journal of Biological Chemistry, Biochemical <laughs> Journal, etc. His work has also resulted in Indian and US patents. Dr. Roy has received several honors and awards for his work, including the J.C. Bose National Fellow uh, by the DST Government of India, National Bioscience Award by DBT, Biotechnology Overseas Associateship, again by DBT, and the Ella Fitzgerald Fellowship uh, from the New York Heart Association, USA. He's also the fellow of the Indian National Science Academy, the National Academy of Sciences India, Indian Academy of Sciences, and a member of the American Peptide Society and Guha Research Conference. So with that introduction, I'd like to invite uh, Professor Roy on the stage to talk about um, his research, which is aptly titled Breaking and Making Peptide Bonds. Over to you. Okay, thank you Bia, for a very pleasing uh, uh, um, introduction. Actually, uh, generally a very reluctant speaker, but uh, Divya and Deepti, both of them, uh, you know, this was the last seminar and uh, I must. So, uh, you know, for years, uh, I have been working on the making and making peptide bonds and use proteases uh, uh, and transpeptide uh, when I started my career uh, many years back, uh, almost 35 years or more back, Indian Institute of Science, I was assigned this task of sequencing a protein. And that's where I was breaking the peptide bonds in a protein. Now, uh, you know, you use proteases and, and uh, in different kinds of proteases get overlapping fragments and then assemble them together and get this sequence. Those days sequencing a protein by classical Edmund degradation uh, technology, uh, not so easy. You have to follow this, it's not. this, Which corrected from the crystal structure by Professor Ram Kumar at IASC uh, with his student Natesh. So it is, it is uh, uh, good to make mistakes. It, it's not a sin. So uh, now uh, coming back to, to uh, making peptide bonds. Now, can this is uh, make peptide bonds? In fact, uh, based on microscopic reversibility of reactions, every reaction goes in the opposite direction. And that must also be true for protease catalyzed reactions and proteases uh, uh, can, can make peptide bonds in principle. Now, uh, actually in 1940s and 50s, it was believed that the mechanism of 
biosynthesis might be based on reversal of proteolysis because the ribosomal machinery of, of uh, uh, protein biosynthesis was not established, neither was uh, genetic code or, or uh, uh, the general DNA-based uh, uh, approaches for, for uh, uh, biosynthesis of proteins. Now, there was a lot of work in 1940s and 50 exploring proteases uh, to see whether they make eventually the proteins in. However, However, uh, and in, in 1953, actually as late as 1953, uh, Henry Bursok wrote a treatise in Advances in Protein Chemistry, where he said that the history of experimental attack on the problem of enzymatic synthesis of proteins is one of the periodic outbursts of activity, stimulated by new methods and ideas, then quiet periods when the leads appeared exhausted. We are in the active phase. Now, this he says in 1953. However, this active phase didn't last for, for long. When in 1955, the protein synthesis process of translation of genetic information was firmly conceptualized by Francis Crick, Sidney Brainer, and others. So, but uh, the examples, uh, weird examples sometimes, and sometimes, uh, uh, you know, expected examples of, of uh, protease catalyzed splicing of peptide bonds keep emerging. Now, one of the classical example is of concannabaline A. Concannabaline A is synthesized as uh, as as a pre pro pro protein wherein these, these, uh, uh, this is from the N-terminus to the C-terminus, and the, the color coding is here just to, to follow this up. Now, this is processed, uh, and you, you get the pre-portion re removed from here through proteolytic cleavage, and you go get the pro-pro. So, and this processing happens here in the, in the blue region. Now, uh, subsequently, you get the pro-protein, wherein you have the N-terminus and the C-terminus. Uh, this portion is uh, proteolized and removed. Now, in the, and then you get the mature protein. Now you see, this is, this is, this, you, you note here that the C-terminus has become the N-terminus and N-terminus has become the C-terminus. Now, why does nature do this? Uh, you don't know, nature can explain it best, but, Ah, this is catalyzed by gene N. So the protein matches these two fragments in the re in, in the uh, reverse order, and probably this this kind of uh, uh, order is is uh, is uh, you know chosen or facilitated by the protease because this product probably is more stable than the normal N to C terminus. Now, how was this discovered? was that people were trying to sequence the con, con was sequenced uh, by the classical protein sequencing methods earlier. Uh, but when the gene sequence came much later, the gene sequence didn't match with this. Obviously it will not match. So that tells you that sometimes, uh, you know, when you get the, the DNA sequence and go through the process and you don't see any activity or anything, uh, you know that there may, may be something else rather than only folding or unfolding or, or something of that kind. Maybe the sequence itself may be different. Uh, no, no, no. I mean, holding means there is no, no uh, non-covalent interaction between these two. Yeah, so I mean, what I mean, when it's getting to no, this is this is not the enzyme which which does these steps. It's only this step. Oh yes, this is real of proteolysis. That's all. But but in a, a sequence is it just interchange. Oh, the, the specific maintained. For example, if you are using trypsin, 
attach two peptide bonds, trypsin keep cleaves at arginines and lysines, right? That is its specificity. So uh, it will attach only lysine and arginine containing terminus. It would not not do otherwise. So so the the this this fragment here there must have been the specificity. Sorry, here the specificity must be uh, you know met for the endoproteinase spiroginase. Okay. Can the public? I mean, why should we even get more? Yes. 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 In that context, I was thinking that if this endo no, say for example, uh, let me give you an example of uh, the cysteine proteases and the serine proteases, right? The, the mechanism is that the cysteine or this uh, serine at the active side forms an acyl enzyme intermediate. And that acyl enzyme intermediate is hydrolyzed by water to, to give you the hydrolyzed peptides. Right now, in case of of the water will be replaced by the amine complex, so it will be aminolysis rather than uh, than than proteolysis. I'll come to that in a moment. It will become clear to you. Yes. Oh, this this process does not require uh, activation of uh, of amino acids. Okay. Like, like when you do chemical peptide synthesis, what you do is you activate one peptide and then you use a condensing agent and you have the coupling of the two peptides, right? Here, you, you don't require that. This is reversal of proteolysis. This is reversal of proteolysis. Just you, you have the proteolytic action and the reaction is reversed by the principle of microscopic reversibility of reaction. But... Uh, the, you know that proteases, the equilibrium is far towards hydrolysis. That's why you don't see the synthetic uh, product, right? So it's 99.999 towards uh, uh, hydrolysis and 0 0.001 towards synthesis, right? So what happens is you have to find out ways to, to shift the equilibrium towards synthesis. So it's only manipulation of equilibrium. But here, this forms because this product probably is more stable. You know, it's, it, it becomes resistant to proteolysis. Okay. Okay. So, so another, another example is that 2004 was found that, uh, you know, what happens in the, the uh, MHC class one presentation to the, the, uh, Come to the next slide, it will become clearer. So, what actually they found was that always you should get a you cannot get a non contiguous if it is going through the usual process. But here they found that a nine residue non contiguous peptide coming from five residue from one end and four residue from the other was found to MSC class one. Now, this can happen only if the, the joint. Otherwise, it would not happen. So at that, now in, in 2016, uh, it was that that is not a, a freak phenomenon, but proteasome performs both slicing as well as splicing of peptides. So, so your, your protein goes through the proteasome, you get uh, various uh, fragments, and then you also have fragments which will be spliced you have the threonyl residue at the active side of, of proteasome. So that forms an acyl enzyme complex, hydrolyzes the peptides, and then peptides come splice peptide. And a large fraction of class 1 ligands are proteasome generated peptides. So it is, it is actually amazing about 25% uh, uh, or so of the peptides generated in the proteasome turn out to be to be uh, non contiguous peptides so this nature has been doing it quite often which is uh, uh, which remains underestimated but when i was compiling this uh, uh, this slide i had made it in 2000
2016-17 when this paper appeared. But when I was compiling this, I looked for an update on this. And it paper in molecular uh, and cell, cellular proteomics has revisited this. And they say that this is an over 25%. So this caution you, you, you should. Okay, now the question is that you have to shift the equilibrium to peptide bond synthesis. Now, what are the major barriers for, for peptide bond synthesis by, by proteases or in general? So one is that the enthalpic uh, barrier, which is the ionization of the carboxyl groups. And the second is the non-proximity of the reacting ends, right? But uh, so, so if you use organic co-solvents, organic co-solvent will, will suppress of the carboxyl. And if you have interaction, entropy is taken off. So, so if classic example, are uh, it was shown that satellisin can cleave ribonuclease A at the 20-21 peptide bond, uh, uh, but the, the complex that is generated uh, will be a non-covalent complex, okay? And this, this complex will be as active as the RNAs A. It will retain the catalyst. Uh, this was also the example of, of demonstration of the existence of non-covalent interactions in protein uh, leading to, to a, a, a functional protein. Okay, so now in 1979, actually, Homenberg and Lasko has shown that, uh, uh, showed that if you put glycerol to this, this, this complex in presence of satellisin, you can get this peptide bond sealed here, okay? So you can convert this non-covalent fragment complementing system to a covalent fragment complementing system. In fact, bulk of on complementing with this and and uh, in fact they subsequently found that if you turn 13 21 to 124 you could still get a functional complex so this this but this was a dream yes it retains 100% of the native activity of the covalently uh, covalent ribonuclease. There, uh... there have been many examples subsequently. As I said, it had been a dream for most proteins of that time to generate complexes like this to study structure function relationships in proteins because uh, the site directed mutagenesis and the kick technology came much later. The, uh, uh, so the nucleus T, somatotropin, thermolysine, many fragment complementing systems were, were uh, uh, generated. Uh, yes? For the formation of the peptide bond, the enthalpic barrier is the ionization of the carboxyl. You need COOH and NH2 to, to form a peptide bond, thermodynamically. Use co-solvent, then co-solvent actually suppresses the ionization of the carboxyl group. Say your dielectric constant reduced, right? So your ionization will be so so that is that is one of the, the ways. No, there is no disulfide in uh, the S peptide. There is no disulfide here. So there is no cysteine in here. Okay. But what it has is a catalytic histidine residue. So if you, if you remove this, uh, it will be inactive. So 21 to 124 is inactive. The 1 to 20 is inactive, but you mix the two in one is to one proportion, get the 100. 
an enzymic activity back. No, you are cutting it here. What happens is there is a nick here, but the peptide remains where it is. So that is how it, it remains functional. The protein remains functional. Okay, now that is for the fragment complementing system. So when you have a fragment complementing system, the protein peptide bond because of entropy advantage that it gets. But what about the fragments which are non-complementing, like the fragments which do not interact with each other? What do you do with them? Now, to those fragments, you can use, so, so this, this fragment will be sealed here because of microscopic reversibility of reaction. And you will get very small amount of product, 0.000% which you cannot see even. It from the chemical equilibrium, okay, then this will, the equilibrium will get shifted uh, towards synthesis. If, if you have two peptides and uh, you have, which is recognizes the product, but not Okay. It can be anything. I, I, I just gave an example of antibody. Trap can be anything. Okay. And I will. No, it can be anything. Non protein is here, anything it can be, which binds to it and removes it from the chemical equilibrium. Okay. Now, so to answer your question, there can be conformational traps. For example, if you start with uh, uh, peptides or, or uh, polypeptide fragments, which are unstructured peptides, and uh, you, you use the co-solvent or no co-solvent, but if it forms a helical structure, then this helical structure may act as a conformational trap. Because you know that, uh, you know, the random structures are more flexible. So they are to cleavage by proteases, whereas uh, would be less flexible and, and more resistant to proteolysis. So if such a thing happens, you may be able to shift it towards uh, uh, synthesis, okay? The, the synthesized product itself acts as a conformational trap. Okay, so now the question is, uh, so we we actually Kumar in, in my lab the the first student uh, uh, in my lab uh, did all this conformational trap business and okay. question arises is conformational trapping possible in the cellular milieu now the cellular milieu. is crowded okay now what are the consequences of crowding the consequences of crowding is that uh, the 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 space is limited for every molecule in the crowded solution so right so what happens is that if if you have the action that is going to make the space uh, available uh, greater extent to, to, to the molecules, then the process will be driven towards that direction, right? So, so if you see, if, if you think, and this is because uh, what is called as stress function, because two, two molecules cannot come closer than their van der Waal radii, so which is marked here with spheres. So, so what you see is, that if you have, uh, th these are the crowded molecules, and if you put an extra molecule of the same size, then the available space for this extra molecule or overall will be reduced much less. 
Whereas here, if, you, if the molecule is of very small size, in finitesimal size, then uh, there won't be much effect. Uh, the, the, the blue space that is shown here is a, a volume ever to, to this small molecule. So based on this, we hypothesized that crowding should affect any reaction that is accompanied by significant reduction in this. What we hypothesized was reverse proteolysis in a crowded milieu via conformational trapping should be possible. And how is it possible? If you take something which have no structure, right? The starting uh, uh, two. Now, through, through microscopic reversibility, they, they form a helix. And then if this, this is a, a, a coiled coil, uh, you know, a, a random to a very compact Uh, reduction volume extrusion. So, so this is occupying much, much complex ones, right? So, for this, you need to design a, a system where you get the product in a coiled, uh, in a coiled coil or of uh, helix bundle type of structure. Now, uh, the you you have to design this, but Sometimes if, if a student doesn't work hard in the lab, he doesn't, he's not doing pipetting all the time, but is interested in reading from literature. So he, uh, Balaji found out from, from uh, literature at that time, 2000, that Boone and Chakravarti had designed a, a studied a peptide like this, which has all the, all the qualities that I described uh, before. So this peptide, Uh, uh, in VVA, they have V. Now, they had seen that if you replace this uh, uh, formation of a helical structure, and through extensive studies, they have found that these peptides, these two peptides were capable of forming Whereas this VVA had no information at all. So Balaji and we were using V8 protein for Ram will remember that which he worked on. Worked out the whole thing and he brought it to me that so, so you can make a synthetic peptide, okay? Uh, the this synthetic peptide one to eleven, and then twelve to twenty. Use V8 protease. The specificity requirement for V8 protease is satisfied here, and C, and use dextran dextrans as being molecule, and so now as predicted here you see the product. V hierarchic uh, so and when you cut these uh, take the complementary fragments one to two, we didn't have to do anything because Boone and Chakravarti had shown that it forms helix bundles these two 
bundles and this this has nothing right so we just had to test this and significantly higher so this to the theory so we propose that conformational trapping and volume exclusion effect for driving hydrolysis in reverse this is only simulated simulated so so it is it is it is uh, uh, a, a theoretical principle that is being demonstrated here it's it's not in fortuitous situations proteases do it right but it's you cannot say that it's a generic phenomenon okay so so in fortuitous situations this is not the only mechanism right but this could be a possible mechanism that uh, if there is there, there are there are all all favorable conditions present there in the crowded cell then there is a possibility that you will get some kind of uh, synthesis okay yes no all the examples uh, that i gave you they do not have any post translation modification hypothetically yes there, there can be everything can be possible until you uh, know or you don't know so now uh, now we shift to to uh, another uh, peptide another example and makes peptide bond and that is sortase which is found in uh, the gram positive bacteria now sortase most of you are familiar because dr venkateshan here has been working on this for a long time and uh, he has been uh, working on the structural aspects of of sortases Uh, however our focus has been uh, the the uh, uh, principle delineating principles uh, which which are operating in sort is uh, uh, mediated peptide ligation reaction now so sort is was first discovered by by sneven in 1999 so it's not a very old enzyme in that sense 20 year old and uh, uh, sneven passed away a couple of years back maybe 3 years back i think and and sneven was was just 59 i think was way so he was he discovered it at a very young age working at rockefeller institute so sortase is is a is, a, is a, 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 a an enzyme which is which is found in gram positive bacteria and it anchors the bacterial surface proteins to the peptidoglycan now how does it do it that all these surface proteins have a lpxtg motif pentapeptide motif which it recognizes cleaves this tg peptide bond here and then peptidoglycan uh, the the pentapeptide uh, uh, branch of the peptidoglycan so it 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 breaks a, a tg peptide bond and then it makes a tg peptide bond okay so so essentially we recognized it as soon as it was it was uh, 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 it was published in 1999 that we can use it for making peptide bond since we were already into this game but uh, those days especially in, in our lab the molecular biology uh, ha had not been standardized and we took some time to clone and express sortase ourselves and then uh, obviously by 2005 2006 we had the clone and we started working on it now sortases come in a variety of forms and they are uh, class a and e which are housekeeping sortases c and d which belong to the pilin sortases and there are others which are meant for dedicated functions so the mechanism is like this that uh, it forms it's a cysteine 
uh, uh, transpeptidase. It cleaves this peptide bond, captures this as a acyl enzyme intermediate, and now uh, it can transfer this to the glycine or the pilin sortages actually transfer it to a, a epsilon amine group of the uh, pilin proteins. So, so this is how the, the pillars uh, uh, polymerizes. So you have the pillars has a, 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 a LPXTG motif. It is a pilin box and a, a, a lysine containing uh, um, residue, which, which forms the in part of the pilin motif. So this is how it goes on on polymerizing this. Now, the the sortes catalyzed reactions also proceed with smaller peptides. So you see the in, in, in vivo, what's happening is surface proteins are being linked to the peptidoglycan, but, but it's a very local reaction. Uh, it, it occurs if you take a LPA TG sequence, LPE TG, uh, it doesn't occur. But if you acetylate it or uh, modify the, the carboxyl end with, with an amide, you get the synthesis. So essentially, it, it, it requires uh, the uh, extension of the pentapeptide motif. So it doesn't act on the pentapeptide motif itself. So, so what it can be used for a variety of, of applications. So we, we actually, uh, Sione in my lab showed that it can also do, the housekeeping sortage of Staphylococcus aureus can also uh, do isopeptide ligation meaning it can very efficiently transfer, uh, uh, which is not a pilin sorted, it's a housekeeping, but it can transfer uh, the LPXTG containing peptides to, to uh, epsilon amine of, of uh, uh, itself or any other peptide. So if you take this, this sequence is, is derived from uh, uh, indolicidine. Uh, Deepak will remember that, probably he worked on indolicidine at NII, if I remember correctly. So, so this is indolicidine, which at the terminus, you extend it by uh, five, five residue, LPNTG, which is, which is the recognition motif. And then if you put sortes to this, uh, it will start uh, making oligomers, right? So you get dimer, trimer, tetramer, pentamer, and hexamer of the same peptide. And uh, you will, it will also make a cyclic peptide, okay? And uh, this, this mode of polymerization is through the epsilon lysine. So it doesn't, doesn't polymerize. Say, for example, here you'll be, it will be an amino group. Here you have uh, the T. The T can go here also. But since it is not a glycine, it doesn't transfer it here. It transfers it to the epsilon amine. So it can also transfer. LPXTG containing peptides to, to uh, sugars, which are derivatized with glycyl, uh, uh, glycine. So if you have glucosamine, it doesn't transfer, but if you have uh, glucosamine derivatized with a glycine residue, which is glycyl glucosamine, you can, you can get the, the, this product. Now, it can transfer efficiently to six amino sugars. So remember, it doesn't transfer to two amino sugars, which is glucosamine, but it transfers to six amino sugars. Now, six amino sugars, perhaps because there is some, some uh, resemblance to glycine uh, structure, say NH2, CH2, CO. So some resemblance kind of sub, very, this is all intuitive and I don't have any rational explanation for this. So it can transfer it to six amino glucose, six amino amino mannose, and so on and so forth. In fact, most of the amino glycoside antibiotics, uh, canamycin, tobramycin, and so on and so forth, it, it, they all have a six amino group. And they have two, uh, the, the primary uh, here, uh, the six amino, they also have two aminos, and so on and so forth. But it specifically uh, targets the six amino and makes this, this kind of conjugates. Now, this, this can be one of the methods to make nucleo. So, so 
to summarize, it doesn't transfer to glucose six uh, glucosamine. Uh, it transfers to six, but not to two. Okay, so this this was uh, Sharmista's work, which was published. And Sharmista actually worked here sometime uh, after uh, finishing PhD from NIA. Now, since since uh, uh, Sortes has uh, a lot of uh, synthetic potential, it can be used for for protein leveling wherein you can you can derivatize the glycine residue with any any label here and you can uh, have a recombinant protein with L lpxtg tab you can take any protein express it with the lpxtg tab and uh, uh, you have a glycine derivatized label it can transfer it very efficiently you can have a fluorescent probe a spectroscopic probe radio anything you can also create protein fusions so you have one recombinant protein with terminal glycine residue and another with the C-terminal LPXTG tag, you can get a, 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 a grid or, or a conjugated protein. Now, we use this strategy to, to uh, uh, make uh, structures of this kind, which are well-defined uh, dendrimeric structures. And uh, we couple this to to click chemistry. And click chemistry, if you, you remember, uh, click chemistry, the, it, philosophically, any reaction that occurs very fast uh, and within a very short time is termed as click. And one of, one of, one of the reactions of this type is the alkyne azide cycloadditions. So if you have an alkyne group and an azide group, you use uh, uh, in presence of copper one plus, you can get this, this uh, 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 addition reaction. So what we did was that you can have a protein expressed with uh, uh, LPXTG and you can have enzymatically with sortase, now you transfer this labeled glycine residue to, to uh, LPXTG containing protein. And then you have this label. Now this label in here is, is, is either a, a, a alkyne or a azide, whatever it is, then you can have a synthetic scaffold where you have, if you have alkyne here, you put azide here and you can, can get, uh, uh, you know, uh, very fast uh, and, and efficient quantitative reaction uh, with uh, this, any protein that is derivatized here. See, the yield is limiting here. Here, since it is click, it's very high, right? But enzymatic yields here uh, with, with sorties, the labeling yield would be 40%, 50%, sometimes 30%, okay, depending upon uh, what the protein is and what you are transferring. Okay, now, Uh, I'll give you two examples of protein engineering using sortages. One is uh, the preparation of sumo conjugates. Uh, now, sumo, there are, there are uh, four sumos in, in humans. And curiously, uh, curiously rather, you have the sumo sequences have this uh, QTGZ motif. Right, so so P P uh, for example sumo four has Q P T G G. So now if you mutate one residue here, you can get the sortage uh, specific site. Now the sumos are actually synthesized as as a, a precursor, wherein the C terminus is extended. Now they are they are processed by SNPs. So and the gly gly here is exposed by SNPs, and then the the sumos uh, epsilon lysine group of uh, any protein gets attached to the gly gly. So it's an isopeptide. Uh, this is in 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 vivo. This is mediated by E1, E2, and E3 enzymes. Uh, there are methods. Uh, for chemical synthesis, this is just to show you that it is very complicated, okay? 
Whereas if you use sortes, what you can do is that you express these sumos with a Newton. So for example, if you have uh, in all the three sumos, you have Q, 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 T, G, G, this is the conserved uh, motif. So you, you, this Q, Q mutated to L, P. And then in one step, you can get the sumo conjugate. The only problem here is when we started working, we, we did not have, uh, or we, we, we knew, but we did not have enough motivation to, to think about a larger protein fragment, okay? So, so you can take a target peptide, which is prefabricated, put it with this. See, this, this is already attached to the epsilon lysine. So sortage will cleave here. It will remove this GG histidine tag from here. And this T will get attached here. So this GG is already you have put in there. So this D, T GG is removed, but that is coming from your, your synthetic uh, peptide fragment. So in one step, you can get this synthesis. So, so what we did was that uh, we made, uh, uh, we took a, a pep, first, first you see that uh, when you make this LPQTGG, the mutant of, of, of the precursor, the SNP2 was able to cleave this. Okay, so what it means is that LP doesn't matter uh, uh, for the for the SNP enzymes, and this can be used uh, uh, as such. So uh, and also uh, the assays uh, were were fine with with this material, so LP was not really bothering us. Now the next step was that you, sorry, this is misplaced here, that you take this this uh, uh, sequence the. See, GG is here, epsilon lysine of this peptide, which was derived from, from uh, uh, the P53 target sequence. So P53 is humoylated at this lysine, but this is a short fragment uh, derived from P53, okay? So you can, you can get, uh, uh, so the, this was the sequence, L, LFM, K, T, G. So now this peptide could go there, and then you could show that, uh, if you take the, the peptide alone with sumo 2 C terminus and, and conjugate it, it, it actually uh, uh, so, so the, the uh, conjugate was this is only the characterization. The conjugate, this conjugate was recognized by SNPs. So sumo 1, sumo 2, sumo, sumo 3, all three conjugates were recognized uh, and, and they were cleaved at the GG peptide bond here. Whereas if you made a, a conjugate with the truncated uh, uh, peptide, this was not recognized. So what it meant was that probably you need the full length uh, sumo sequence for recognition by SNPs. So anyway, so, so essentially the take home message here is that uh, the tolerance of sumo one, two, three by sumoylation machinery may be exploited to delineate isoform selectivity of target proteins and sumo conjugates can serve as bona fide substrate of desumulating enzymes. Now, we published that in, in, in uh, Chem Biochem. Uh, it didn't go through a big journal because all of them were asking for, show it with a protein. Now, that after our paper was published, same uh, the genetic code expansion in sorties. Now, they use genetic code expansion to, to put a large protein fragment using sorted. So the strategy was the same, but uh, uh, they used genetic code expansion to put a large, large fragment published in Nature Chemical Biology. Now the other, uh, I'll quickly go through semi-synthetic histones with defined chemical marks for interrogation of, of uh, uh, so, so essentially here, as you know that the eukaryotic genome uh, within within uh, nucleus exists as as a uh, 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 highly organized structure comprising uh, uh, dna and histones now there are four histones the, the uh, two two copies of each form an octamer and this octamer is is wrapped up by a 146 base pair of, of nucleic acids now Stones, uh, 
by, by precise action of uh, enzymes and scaffolding proteins, which are called writers, readers, and erasers. Now, there are Uh, this. Now, the problem is that chemically defined histones are difficult to obtain. So there are, for example, if you think of a section of histones, there are actually more than 50 sites in, in all the four stones for, for acetylation. So you don't know what, which site is doing what. So you need chemically defined histones, which are difficult to make because of multiplicity of sites, variations, and so on and so forth. Now, we uh, uh, we embarked upon making uh, acetylated histones specifically marked at one site. So, uh, so histones acetylation proceeds uh, by histone acetyl transferases and it is removed by histone deacetylases. And there are actually 18 human H dash. Okay. Uh, there may be redundancies, there may be specificities. And deciphering the substrate specificity of HDAX is critical. So what we did was that, just to give you one example, you can, you can actually make uh, the semi-synthetic histones with precise uh, uh, acetylated uh, acetylation uh, using the sortage methodology. So what you can do is you, you need to make two changes, L and T mutated for 9 and 12. And we introduced this uh, uh, acet uh, the acetylation at the K5 site. And then you can take the, the remainder fragment recombinant and then put them together, use sortes, and you get the semi-synthetic stone. Now, this, this stone is actually uh, semi-synthetic stone is recognized by the, the H2B K5 uh, uh, antibodies and H2 molecular H9. Okay, now HDAX also exists in complexes in cells. And uh, so that is why we, we chose to uh, uh, determine the specificity of, of these uh, uh, HDAX over expressing them in cell line. So you have each of these HDAX expressed in, in, in uh, 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 the, uh, the, uh, uh, this, uh, uh, what cell like CHO? Uh, HE. <laughs> See, this is this is what happens when you lose touch with the lab. Okay, so so here you can say that uh, there, this HDAC one seems to be the the target. The H two BK five AC is targeted by HDAC one, and this is uh, with the the lysate. This is with the recombinant HDAC one. So. Now, uh, you can actually make, reconstitute with this H2BK5AC, the nucleosomes. And here is uh, that you can separate the nucleosome and these are all the characterization. The H2BK5AC semi-synthetic is, is, uh, is, is recognized in the nucleosomes as well. And uh, these are uh, simple assays. And then I'll summarize saying that sortage mediated semi-synthesis is a viable strategy for engineering uh, defined epigenetic marks in histone and HDAC1. Actually, I don't want to talk much about it. There are no in the process and it is not published. Hopefully we'll publish it someday. Now, Kartik is uh, along with Sumit uh, at RCB. They are exploring the uh, in vivo uh, cellular assays for, for uh, establishing that what you see in vitro is working in vivo. Uh, and these are the PhD students who have contributed uh, to this work. Many, many contributions uh, by uh, some of these students were not, not uh, really shown in the talk today or the slides today. Uh, and uh, Ram Kumar had been a very long time collaborator, and we have uh, had uh, crystal structures of uh, two sort ages from. Uh, uh, has been uh, uh, instrumental in MD simulation studies and other things uh, that we did earlier. Now, uh, 
uh, vegetation is now got one one crystal uh, uh, structure for a new shortage for us and uh, he's working with his own group and and uh, uh, sumit who would be who who, who is getting uh, exasperated to submit his thesis to Musha. and uh, funding from here and bulk of this work was done here almost all the work was done here hopefully something else will come out here in the next two three years Okay, thank you. Some quick questions and then I will have to rush back for a meeting. Yes. Oh, just just because I can make those those uh, services that you disclose in a precise manner. That is why. No, and also the the HDAC specificities are not known. For see, you 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 need specific, uh, and then the modulation modulation of uh, one site modulating uh, the other site, right? So those things are not really uh, uh, known in in details. So now, for if we put two modification, a methyl group on a lysine. An acetyl group on another lysine, and get nucleosomes uh, out of that, or or do in in cellular assays, and find out how they are modulating each other, uh, uh, how they are regulating each other. So th th there is a lot of lot of uh, stuff that one can do. Oh, it can be done. It can be done. But uh, I don't know how somebody else can. Yes, Savina. No, in, in cells, uh, uh, you mean you over sort as the, uh, in the cells and then. No, I, I didn't get your first point that. Of what? Uh, of RNA splicing. RNA splicing, how, how it is going to be? No, I, I'm not sure. You're, you're mixing up two things. Huh? No, 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 no. No, actually, there are there are a lot of this, lot of these uh, uh, From plants and and it's huge enzyme, and uh, it's but it, once you purify it, it's it's very efficient. So I don't think there is a, a way to readily access that that material for use. So I haven't seen uh, much application of that, right? As for shortages, uh, it's very easy to clone express and start using it, right? Although this is not a very robust enzyme, you know, its turnover rate is it's, it's not very high. Actually, with shortage itself in mammalian mammalian cells, show that in vivo you can uh, synthesize the through through this. Your question of uh, I didn't. Like now we can take you around 
रैंडमली बट रैंडम रैंडम सिचुएशन इज केटिक नो गेट इट टू दैंसर सेल्स हाउ डू यू टारगेट इट targeted expression why yes. not be useful yes yes sunny so thing actually would facilitate association reaction because association will will uh, uh, result in increase of uh, uh, of space for available space for every molecule overall so that is that is the concept here so what is called as the volume volume exclusion effect because every molecule will exclude some volume to the other because no molecule can come closer to to the closer than the van der waal radius right so this volume exclusion it occurs also in dilute solution but it is minuscule not not significant right but in crowded it it becomes more more meaningful but along with crowding also the uh, is is diffusion there will be a diffusion problem most enzymatic reaction so so which are suppose diffusion control reaction so diffusion will be very uh, will be counterproductive Okay, if there are no more questions, thank you very much. Thank you.